Okay, you're welcome back. Let us begin. And uh, we are in the middle of calculating and discussing effective potentials. Last time I introduced uh, the general effective action gamma. And a part of the effective action is the part where there are no derivatives and no momentum dependencies. And that is the effective potential, which is a correction to the three level potential of, uh, in particular, scalar fields. And we calculated a one loop correction to such an effective potential in a specific theory, namely the simplest phi to the four theory. And as we discussed, there are quite non trivial corrections to the effective potential which are non polynomial in the field. So this is a copy from the last lecture. And inside of the capital M, there is a dependence on the field strength phi zero. And the A zero function is a non-polynomial function of M square, and therefore also a non-polynomial function of the field phi zero. That result is not yet complete because it is unrenormalized and it depends on so-called bare quantities. And today, we will finish the discussion by adding the renormalization. And in the end, we will obtain a finite result for the effective potential. In the exercise last week, you already discussed the renormalization for a more complicated case, namely for the case including Yukawa interactions. This is the simpler case without Yukawa interactions. And uh, therefore, we do not discuss too much about this because the more detailed discussion was already in the exercise. But we will wrap it up by spelling out the necessary details. And also, the last time in the lecture, we already had a physics discussion of the meaning of the effective potential. The minimum of the effective potential corresponds to the ground state of the theory. And because of the one loop corrections, the position and the nature of the minimum can change. And in particular for the Yukawa theory, where there are negative corrections to the effective potential, it might be that out of a Mexican head shape or out of a normal parabola shape, there is generated a potential which is unbounded from below, or even some more complicated shapes such that the minimum location and nature can be modified by going from three level to one loop. And that has important implications for the standard model of particle physics, where exactly this can happen depending on the details of the values of input parameters. OK, so having said all that, let us do the renormalization of this potential. And uh, that is section 333. So let us simply remind ourselves of the structure of renormalization in the phi to the four theory. The renormalization can be done in the unshifted theory, where we do not uh, introduce that shift phi goes to phi plus phi zero and derive new Feynman rules. The renormalization just proceeds on the level of the original Lagrangian. And there, um, so far, we had so-called bare quantities defining our Lagrangian. And now we apply a renormalization transformation, which means that uh, the mass square parameter m square goes to m square plus delta m square. The coupling constant g, or yeah, what's it called, g, goes to g plus delta g. And the field phi goes to square root of z times phi. And z, the field strength renormalization constant, is 1 plus delta z. And then in all these cases, by definition, we call uh, that part here um, the renormalized quantities, uh, renormalized mass, renormalized coupling, and OK, one. And these objects here, they are renormalization constants.
And by definition, the renormalized quantities, they are of the order tree level. That means h bar to the power zero because loops uh, are proportional to powers of h bar. So these are um, tree level quantities and the renormalization constants, they are of order at least one loop. So at least order h bar to the first power. And then we can separate cleanly uh, powers of loops in terms of powers of h bar. Then in order to renormalize, we need to fix a renormalization scheme. And here we use the so-called MS bar renormalization scheme, modified minimal subtraction, which is a common choice. And it corresponds to the following. It is a minimal subtraction. of 1 over epsilon plus some irrational constants. And a simple way to implement it is to define the dimensional regularization scale mu square, which appears in front of all the loop integrals, is now redefined to mu square index ms bar. Some people might drop the index, but for clarity, let us uh, keep that index mu square in the ms bar scheme times the following e to the power gamma e divided by 4 pi. So the mu square is rescaled by an irrational factor. That doesn't change really its meaning because mu square is anyway unphysical. But uh, by that redefinition, we introduce some irrational constants. Wherever mu square appears, there appears some combination of irrational constants. And those are exactly the irrational constants which we want to drop out together with the 1 over epsilon. Remember that in loop integrals, the coefficient of 1 over epsilon is always the same as the coefficient of log mu square. So if that happens, then uh, after that replacement, the coefficient of 1 over epsilon is the same as the coefficient of log mu square ms bar plus the coefficient of gamma e minus the coefficient of log 4 pi. And those are exactly the constants that we want to drop out in the ms bar scheme. So then in the ms bar scheme, we simply say delta z, delta m square, and delta g are by definition pure um, uh, purely 1 over epsilon terms. So there are no finite um, pieces uh, in, inside of the renormalization constants. And then we can simply plug this into the effective potential. and expand in powers of loops or equivalently in powers of h bar because loops are proportional to h bar. And then we have three level potential plus the one loop potential is equal to the following. So, um, ah, no. Maybe should we introduce for clarity the following? Maybe let us make a change here. Um, let us write instead of the same symbol here on the left and the right, let us write m bar square and g bar here, um, such that the renormalized constants in our theory have now a specific notation with a bar, which denotes that they are defined in the MS bar scheme that goes along with defining that delta m square and delta g are pure 1 over epsilon terms. And in that context, we will define the renormalized quantities as with a bar. So that just makes it a little bit clearer. And then uh, the tree level potential is now m bar square times uh, phi 0 square over 2 plus 
g bar divided by 4 factorial times phi 0 cube. Then uh, we apply the renormalization transformation plus delta m square over 2 times phi 0 square plus delta g divided by 4 factorial times phi 0 to the fourth power. And then you see I separated it in such a way that here we have three level quantities and here we have one loop quantities in terms of the renormalization constants. And then we add the one loop potential, which is, let's squeeze it here, 1 over 16 pi square times 1 over 4. And then let's just look at uh, the divergent part of the A0, which is simply m squared divided by epsilon plus something finite. And if we, for the moment, just write down the divergent part, then we get here minus m bar to the fourth power divided by epsilon plus some finite expressions. Okay. And then you see I separated it still in this way. Here we have three level quantities and here we have lots of one loop quantities. And in the one loop quantities we have terms coming from renormalization constants and terms coming from explicit one loop calculations. We are inside of the one loop calculations uh, that is order h bar already. I can replace the bare quantities by three level quantities so I can replace the m by m bar because if I would introduce here a renormalization constant that would be of two loop order. One loop times one loop renormalization constant is two loop. Therefore here I can just replace parameters by three level parameters. And here I've used something delta z is uh, zero at one loop order in such a phi to the 4 theory. That is just a known result uh, which we derived in other lectures and which we also derived in the exercise. Therefore, there is no appearance of this delta z. So, we must now uh, use that m bar to the fourth power has the following value. It is small m bar to the fourth power plus g bar times m bar square times phi zero square plus g bar square over four times phi zero to the fourth power. That is just inserting the definition. And then we can look at the structure of the divergences. The structure of divergences contains here from the m bar to the 4 divided by epsilon, it contains a term which is divergent proportional to the field square and it contains a divergent term proportional to field to the fourth power. And so we want the divergences to cancel individually, therefore the phi to the 4 divergence must be cancelled by the delta g and the phi square divergence must be cancelled by the delta m square. And so from this comparison, we can read off the values of the renormalization constants. And we get delta m square is equal to 1 over 16 pi square times m bar square times g bar divided by 2 and delta g is equal to 1 over 16 pi square times 3 over 2 times g bar square and uh, this makes the theory finite. First of all the potential but it also agrees with the known result from phi to the 4 renormalization in general. And what I mean by this is what you have done in the exercise. There 
you have calculated the renormalization constants in the standard way by saying that the self-energy and four-point function of the theory should get finite and then this determines the delta m square and delta g and delta z and you obtain the same values in phi to the four theory um, but uh, the requirement that the potential becomes finite leads to the same result so the renormalization is consistent um, and with the same choice of renormalization constants all relevant quantities of the theory simultaneously become finite. One remark um, that there is a term which is independent of phi zero that is ignored here. It could be made finite by adding a cosmological constant to the theory. So that would just be a constant in the Lagrangian, but a Lag constant in the Lagrangian doesn't influence any physics that we are interested in, therefore we ignore it. Okay, and then we obtain the renormalized result. By plugging in the full value of the A0 function. And uh, you did similar discussions in the exercise, therefore I just write down the full result. So the potential up to the one loop level in the MS bar scheme has now the following uh, structure, namely um, 1 over 16 pi square times 1 over 4 minus m bar to the fourth power times 3 over 2 minus L where this L is the logarithm of m bar square divided by this mu square in the MS bar scheme. Okay, and so here you see m bar to the four is given here so it's a non-polynomial correction to the potential because there appears a logarithm of the m bar square and m bar in turn depends on phi square and phi to the four. So we have a non-polynomial result for the potential. And here in this case, the prefactor of the biggest term in the potential is actually positive. So you see here minus times minus uh, for large m, the logarithm is positive and dominates, and then the dominating term is positive here. So we get a positive definite correction to the potential at large field strengths, and uh, that makes the potential just more stable compared to tree level. And in the Yukawa theory with fermion loops with a negative sign, you can get uh, exactly terms with the opposite behavior which are negative definite and so they could uh, bend over the potential and make it unstable or generate new minima and that is what happens in the standard model. Okay so this ends our discussion of the effective potential and we can come to another topic. So are there questions to this? Let us come to a new topic, namely symmetries. Symmetries are an extremely important topic in modern physics, in particular particle physics, but also beyond. And symmetries play obviously an extremely important role in concrete quantum field theories, but also in general studies. And in particular, in applications of quantum field theory to concrete systems like the standard model of particle physics or other theories. So for this reason, we discuss symmetries also in the other lectures 
for example, in the standard model lecture, symmetries and gauge invariants and consequences of them are extremely important. So here in this lecture, I mainly want to uh, give you a few general results and general strategies of how to deal with symmetries. We will not discuss here phenomenological applications, but we will discuss methods and general results connected to symmetries. And in particular, we will look at symmetries through the lens of uh, the effective action, because uh, the effective action provides an excellent tool to study symmetries. What I want to do in particular is first some general statements on classifications of symmetries. That is not yet connected to the effective action. Then we will formulate symmetries for the effective action gamma in terms of so-called ward identities and slavnov taylor identities. We've already seen them in other contexts, but we will formulate them now for ward identity, uh, for gamma. And uh, then we discuss the renormalization in the context of symmetries uh, and in the context of describing symmetries via the effective action. And uh, a part of that will be the discussion of so-called anomalies, in other words, symmetry breakings by loop effects. And uh, another part of that will be uh, at least a sketch, a quite detailed sketch of the renormalizability of gauge theories, young mills theories in particular. Uh, anything else? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, a big topic will be, of course, spontaneous symmetry breaking. How could I forget that? So, okay, so that will be uh, basically the order that we will uh, deal with. And uh, so let us immediately begin with a classification of symmetries. how they can appear in quantum field theories. And so there are basically five categories that you can distinguish. And let me just list them. You have seen them all, uh, at least most of them in some contexts. But uh, to systematize it, we can distinguish discrete symmetries or continuous symmetries. Most symmetries that we typically deal with are continuous symmetries. And in the following, we will mainly be concerned with continuous symmetries. And we will actually not discuss discrete symmetries, except for let us now collect a few examples of what would be discrete symmetries. Discrete symmetries are, for example, parity, charge conjugation, time reversal, those discrete operations that one can do in particle physics. But there are beyond that also other discrete symmetries on the Lagrangian, for example, if you have a Lagrangian like phi to the 4 actually. In the phi to the 4 theory, if you flip the sign of the field, then the Lagrangian stays invariant. It is a real field, but the Lagrangian contains only phi square and phi to the 4. Therefore, it is invariant under a flip of the sign. So that is a discrete symmetry of the Lagrangian. And that symmetry has, of course, consequences. In the full theory, for example, even at the loop level, the effective potential was still invariant under a sign flip, because also the loop corrections contained only phi square and functions of phi square. OK, so these are discrete symmetries. However, they are not in the focus of our main discussion even though they are definitely of high interest for applications. Another um, uh, category is um, global symmetries versus local symmetries. Where 
local symmetries are in particular gauge transformations and gauge symmetries. And uh, the special property of gauge symmetries and local symmetries, therefore, are that we have unphysical degrees of freedom. If the theory is invariant under such a local transformation, it always means that there are certain objects in the theory, certain field components, which you can gauge away without changing the physics. Therefore, they are unphysical. So that corresponds to gauge redundancies. So there's a nice uh, word for that, gauge redundancies. Unphysical degrees of freedom. So the interpretation of the symmetry is typically more difficult. However, actually, um, for us in this particular section, in the way we will look at symmetries, there will be not such a dramatic difference between global and local symmetries. But we have already seen in many, many other contexts of the lecture how we need to interpret gauge theories. And that was a big deal in our quantum field theory one and also quantum field theory two so far. Uh, but in this section, the difference will not play such a big role. Then uh, the third distinction that you can do is, is the symmetry exactly realized? The so-called Wigner phase or spontaneously broken. And uh, so here that means the vacuum is invariant. And spontaneous symmetry breaking means that really the symmetry is not broken at all, but the vacuum state is not invariant under a symmetry transformation. And that means that small fluctuations around the ground state, they do not uh, immediately have the full manifestation of the symmetry, but the symmetry manifests itself in different ways. For example, in the uh, way that uh, massless Goldstone bosons appear as excitations of the vacuum. And uh, again, this is different in the case of local symmetries, where uh, there is the Higgs mechanism. So we get either uh, Goldstone bosons or the Goldstone theorem or the Higgs mechanism. Then the fourth category is uh, whether the symmetry is actually a symmetry in the quantum theory or only on the classical level. Let's say um, valid at the quantum level or broken by quantum effects. So in the second case, it would mean that you have a symmetry of the Lagrangian. So your classical counterpart of the theory has a certain symmetry. But the quantum theory that is connected to the Lagrangian does not have the same symmetry. So the symmetry will be broken by effects of the order h bar, um, which are not visible on the classical level. And uh, this has a name. These are the so-called anomalies. Where obviously the name anomaly is a very bad name. I cannot stop stressing that because anomaly is used for absolutely almost anything. Uh, but here it's a specific technical term for this situation that a classical symmetry is broken by quantum effects. And in principle, why not? I mean, it's a rare, actually, and we will discuss it. Um, most symmetries are not broken by quantum effects, but uh, some are. So uh, then the fifth uh, thing is if you have a field transformation in the theory phi goes to phi plus delta phi, then we can ask, is this delta phi actually linear? or nonlinear. 
in the quantum fields of the theory. So this uh, field variation must be some expression. You have seen examples in the past. Um, and uh, it can be a linear expression or a nonlinear expression and that will lead to technical differences in the treatment. In particular, if you have nonlinear uh, products, that means if you calculate expectation values, uh, the expectation value of a product is different from the product of expectation values and therefore uh, this treatment is more technically difficult. So let me just say uh, an expectation value of a product is different from the product of expectation values and that leads obviously to complications. In particular, that will be a complication that we need to take into account uh, in the context of our discussion here, in the context of the effective action gamma. Okay, so this is an overview of possible symmetries and now we want to describe continuous <coughs> symmetries. Global or local doesn't really matter. Uh, first, we will uh, not consider spontaneous symmetry breaking, but in the end we will. We will study anomalies and we will take into account the technical complication. Let us start by formulating symmetries with the effective action gamma. Let me begin with a few repetitions uh, of, yes? Yeah, may I ask a question related to the classification? Um, could also be the opposite of four be a valid classification? So a symmetry that is present at the quantum level, but not at the classical level. So for example, some new convergent symmetry which just arises due to quantum fluctuations, and then one goes to the classical level and it's absent. Is it also valid? I mean, it's uh, emergent symmetry uh, can happen, but I would say this uh, typical emerging for particular energy ranges. For example, emerging at low energies in particular, uh, that is very important. So at long range, you get uh, certain symmetries which you do not uh, see uh, microscopically. However, if in the end the symmetry is a symmetry of the quantum theory, you do an expansion in powers of h bar, then it would of course have to be also valid at h bar to the zero order, uh, unless such a power expansion doesn't make sense at all. And uh, so therefore I would say the opposite case um, is hard to imagine. Okay, so two small repetitions. So uh, let's look at some field transformations. Phi i goes to phi i plus delta phi i. The action should stay invariant under that transformation and let us assume that the path integral measure is invariant. We have already seen uh, this condition and under that condition in the section on path integrals we derived some consequences, namely we derived the validity of so-called slavnov taylor identities. Which we can express for example in this shorthand way that the variation of an expectation value of time, time ordered expectation value of fields vanishes. And so that was a shorthand notation for the sum of green functions where you apply the variation on any field individually and sum them all up. These are slavnov taylor identities and they can be derived directly with a very simple calculation from the path integral using this condition. Now my comment on that is that if you really take seriously the path integral and go to higher orders including loops, then of course under the name path integral measure 
there must be buried um, some renormalization and regularization procedure by which you define actually the finite theory at higher orders. Similarly, the Lagrangian might contain counterterms which cancel divergences and the counterterms would depend on the regularization, renormalization procedure that is hidden uh, inside of those statements. This might contain regularization, renormalization procedure and counter terms. And uh, so then in that sense, um, it might be a non-trivial question whether the path integral measure which takes this into account is really invariant and whether the Lagrangian which takes this into account uh, is really invariant and so on. But under the assumption that it is valid, the slavnov taylor identities must hold. On the other hand, we looked at a specific regularization, namely dimensional regularization. There we derived and proved that the path integral measure in quotation marks because this is now effectively defined by saying calculate all loop diagrams in dimensional regularization that effectively defines a path integral and that is invariant. Always under any such uh, symmetry transformation. And uh, then we do not need to require in that context whether the Lagrangian has any property. It might be non-invariant, but we always get a relationship, namely the corresponding variation of green functions in the same sense of quotation marks, plus the following phi 1 up to phi n times i times the integral of the variation of the Lagrangian evaluated in d dimensions, that is zero. So and then it might or might not be true that uh, the d-dimensional Lagrangian is invariant under a symmetry. But anyway, that again is a direct consequence of a simple path integral manipulation, which is uh, proven to be always valid in dimensional regularization. And here one remark is that this d-dimensional Lagrangian might be of course different from the four-dimensional counterpart. Sometimes you cannot easily or directly extend uh, a Lagrangian from four to d dimensions. So in, in the following, We will mainly assume uh, the validity of the slavnov taylor identities and draw consequences. So we will start from this and then uh, look what uh, we can do with it. But in some cases, which we will then point out, uh, we will go away from that assumption. Now uh, for something new. Let us formulate the slavnov taylor identity for the effective action gamma. Let us start from the general slavnov taylor identity in this way and rewrite it as an identity for the effective action gamma. So we use the same assumptions, I copy them just for clarity. We have a field variation, uh, so a continuous um, transformation with infinitesimal variations. The action stays invariant and the measure is also invariant. So then we obtain this identity. And let me now write the identity in a more explicit form, in the path integral form, path integral over d phi, 
of the following um, e to the i times the action plus source j i times phi i plus the variation j i times delta phi i minus the same thing without the delta that is zero. Okay. So uh, that is what we derived and I just copy from the middle of our derivation and let me briefly explain once again what we have done. Namely this second part here is the original generating functional for all green functions with the action and source terms such that derivatives with respect to the sources generate any possible green function that you might like to calculate. On that we then uh, performed this transformation. We use that the Lagrangian and the measure are invariant, but the source term is not invariant. Therefore, this is the thing that we obtain by performing the transformation. It is the same as the original one. Therefore, the difference gives zero. The only difference comes from the additional term in the exponent, which is infinitesimal. Therefore, in the next step, we will say e to the infinitesimal quantity is 1 plus that infinitesimal quantity, neglecting higher orders. Then everything drops out except for the term where this appears in front of the exponential. Therefore, we get 0 is equal to the following path integral of i times the integral of the sources times the field variations times e to the i times the action plus the source terms. And uh, that is of course nothing but uh, uh, a sum of expectation values. So here we see that zero is equal to an integral over some variable x times sources j i at x times the expectation value of the field variation delta phi i in the presence of sources j. Because all of that path integral here is by definition nothing but the expectation value of that operator in the presence of the sources. And so this is a completely equivalent way to write uh, the slavnov taylor identities in the box above. And now from this construction we can read off an equivalent formulation for the effective action gamma because gamma was defined by a Legendre transformation and derivatives with respect to gamma uh, give by definition of the Legendre transformation the source j. Therefore we can directly and simply replace the source j by derivatives of gamma and then we have immediately uh, Slavnov Taylor identity formulation for gamma. So, by the construction of the Legendre transformation, the source Ji of x was given by minus the derivative of gamma with respect to the classical field argument phi i at x of gamma. So that was the definition of the Legendre transformation. And as I said, therefore we can just replace it. We get the following slavnov taylor identity, namely 0 is equal to an integral over the x variable times delta phi i at x expectation value in the presence of sources j times derivative d gamma by d phi i of x. That is now the equivalent slavnov taylor identity for the effective action. And now if you zoom out a little bit, then this just looks like an invariance relation. Uh, forgetting about the details, you have here some sum of deltas times derivative with respect to the fields. This is exactly how you would write down an infinitesimal variation of some quantity 
where the field transforms in this way. So we can write it without derivatives in a finite way. So then it looks maybe even more suggestive. We get an invariance relation, which looks like this, gamma, with some arguments phi. Remember the classical field expectation values phi, they are the arguments of gamma, is the same as gamma of phi plus this variation. Okay? So that is the invariance relation. And the upper equation is just the infinitesimal form of the lower equation. So you can transform the classical field arguments by this shift, which is an infinitesimal shift, and uh, the effective action stays invariant. So, and technically it will almost always be easier to work with the infinitesimal and derivative form because that is more explicit. But from the physics interpretation, uh, the second form is of course very nice and probably easier to memorize because it tells you that the effective action has an invariance under a field transformation and that is obviously, I hope you see the connection, basically the same as the invariance of the classical action. Because what was the starting point? We had a symmetry of classical fields, phi goes to phi plus delta phi, and the classical action is invariant under that symmetry. So therefore, if you plug into the action this field or that field, you get the same. And so here you have the same. The effective action has almost the same invariance, but not quite the same, because uh, first of all, the meaning of the phi is different. Here, this is really just a classical field, and that is a product of classical fields, maybe. Here, this is the expectation value of a quantum field operator, which has classical properties, but anyway, it's the expectation value of a quantum field operator. And uh, the shift is the expectation value of the delta phi operator in the presence of sources J. So this is surely related, but maybe not exactly the same as the original classical delta phi. So this is um, an expression of the symmetry for the full quantum theory. And so let us highlight that the classical action is replaced by the quantum effective action and the classical expression delta phi is replaced by the expectation value of the operator delta phi in the presence of sources j. Yep. Mm. And what does it now mean that this invariant relation has also a dependence on the J? Is there like an interpretation for this? Or? Interpretation? Uh, well, I mean, we will uh, go a little bit into more details about the nonlinear case. It could also be linear. Maybe, I um, think, let me. Let me first discuss the linear case and then by contrast you will probably uh, understand uh, the answer to your question better. So please keep it in mind, but generally speaking, um, if you remember the Legendre transformation was such that first, here we have a purely classical theory, there are no operators at all. Then we introduce operators and we get operator expectation values. Uh, and green functions and so on. And one particular expectation value that we are interested in is just the expectation value of one single field operator. And we call that phi classical. So that is again a number. So it uh, is number value just like the original classical field, but it is now coming out of a complicated quantum expression. And it depends on the source j. Okay, but then this becomes the argument of gamma. So once it's the argument of gamma, uh, you can treat it like a classical field and gamma behaves like a, similarly like a classical action, but the interpretation 
of its arguments is actually a little bit tricky. And uh, so of course you might say that depends on j, but you can also view it as the independent variable and then j would depend on phi. Okay. But then uh, here there appear maybe expectation values of products and uh, they have this property that I mentioned before, expectation value of product is not the same as product of expectation values. However, if that is not a product but just a um, linear combination, then you get back the original classical expression. Okay, but let me just uh, do this in more explicit terms because I wanted to do it anyway in more detail because that is kind of important. So as I said, let us contrast linear and nonlinear field transformations. And let us first begin with a linear case. So here we have phi i goes to phi i plus delta phi i and this variation delta phi i is linear, more precisely speaking at most linear. So it might contain some constant a i plus b i j times fields phi j. So at most linear is the more precise way of saying it. So and this is a linear combination. of fields. So that would be the classical expression of our field transformation and then we go to the quantum theory. All of this becomes operators and then we have here an operator transformation where on the right hand side we have a linear combination of our fundamental field operators. In that case, what is actually the meaning of this delta phi i expectation value in the presence of sources j? And that answers your question in a way for the linear case. So this is now expectation value of this. So that is a number, so we simply get a number back plus number can be pulled out of the expectation value times the expectation value of the fields phi j in the presence of sources j. But the expectation value of a field operator in the presence of the source is again just uh, the field phi without the expectation value in the context of our Legendre transformation. So that is by definition just a classical field uh, as we just said before, where this is now regarded as an argument of the effective action gamma defined via the Legendre transformation and that is the definition of this Legendre transformation. Therefore here the delta phi in the presence of sources j is literally the identical expression as in the classical theory. And then of course our uh, maybe complicated looking identity over there just means that gamma is invariant under exactly the same symmetry transformation as the classical action, as simple as that. So the symmetry invariance of gamma is the same as of the classical action L. And so we can simplify the slavnov taylor identity and the slavnov taylor identity becomes what we typically call a word identity. So in the linear case we call these things word identities and uh, writing it directly for that case we can say zero is equal to the integral over the variable x times delta phi i of x times the derivative of gamma with respect to phi i at x. And here we have simply the classical expression of the field variation and that leaves the uh, effective action invariant. And I do not copy the second version, that is of course also true. Okay. But in this form it is particularly useful and often applied in practice. So we have the identical symmetry of gamma 
as uh, on the classical level. Very simple and very nice and uh, that is hopefully a sensible interpretation. And uh, what are examples of such linear symmetries in practice or in applications? Some examples of such linear symmetries are, for example, baryon number or lepton number. Because those can be written as phase transformations where you transform each baryon field by a phase e to the i alpha times the baryon number. So this is a linear symmetry. Uh, other linear symmetries are, for example, uh, global gauge transformations. Global means that in the gauge transformation you do not allow an x dependence of your transformations, but you do it in a rigid way. All space time points transforms in the identical way. And then you see that uh, even in non abelian gauge theories, the gauge transformations become linear combinations of the fields. Whereas if you allow those um, x dependencies, then that is not linear anymore, at least not always. So all of those uh, important symmetries can be treated in this simple way. And uh, so different people call things differently, so be aware of that. In our context and not only uh, our personal context but in the literature uh, where symmetries are formulated for gamma, very frequently uh, word identities refer to those identities where we have such linear transformations which uh, you can write down explicitly without uh, um, quantities that are actually difficult, which would require some calculation. So this is here an explicit expression. Okay, so let us now look at the other case, the nonlinear case. Here we allow that our field variation is a nonlinear product So, of quantum fields, so that in the quantum theory, that would be a product of operators, such that the expectation value behaves in a complicated way. And so let us simply say, as an example, delta phi i would uh, be given by product of two fields, phi k times phi uh, j. Um, and uh, then, as we said already, the product expectation value might be different from the individual expectation values. And those individual expectation values, they would correspond to the classical expression. That would be just the classical phi j and that is the classical phi k. But uh, the combination that we need in our symmetry identity is different from the classical product. That is the point. So then we get a non-trivial change of the symmetry transformation. And so in this case, Gamma is invariant under a modified symmetry transformation compared to the classical action. And uh, we cannot say anything more at this stage on what that means and uh, what are the results of this. I mean, it's just a general calculation and we get something new. And what is the new thing depends on the details. Uh, what I can do and what I want to do is to introduce a formalism which allows you to deal with this situation and which is very often used in practice. Namely, we introduce new sources in the path integral. Remember that here you see it still, the path integral contains those sources J for fields. Such that if you take derivatives with respect to J, you get uh, expectation values of fields. Now we see that it becomes important to have control over expectation values of products of fields. And they cannot be obtained by uh, products of individual expectation values. Therefore, we cannot get them by taking derivatives with respect to j many times. But we need something new. 
and that are new sources in the path integral. So that is useful. Um, we augment uh, the Lagrangian or respectively the generating functional set of J such that we now have a generating functional set of J comma K new types of sources K for those uh, so-called composite operators. And the path integral definition would be this. Path integral over e to the i times the action plus the ordinary source terms for the fields j i times phi i plus new sources k i times delta phi i. And then a derivative with respect to such a source k i pulls down a delta phi i and generates expectation values of the delta phi i's in the presence of sources j and also in the presence of new sources k uh, such that in this way we have technical control over those objects that we need in our slavnov taylor identity. So derivative with respect to k generates uh, expectation value of delta phi, oops, <coughs> delta phi k. And in the Legendre transformation, we do not um, Legendre transform with respect to k. So the Legendre transformation is only with respect to J. Therefore, uh, the, the derivative with respect to K, first of all applied onto the full generating functional, generates full green functions involving this. But the same is true if you apply such a derivative onto the generating functional W for the connected green function. And also it remains true for derivatives of gamma with respect to K. Um, that will generate one particle irreducible parts. And so therefore, we can directly plug that in. And our slavnov taylor identity at the top here will be equivalent, is equivalent to 0 is equal to the integral over x. And instead of that object, we have now derivative of gamma with respect to ki at x that generates the desired expectation value times derivative of gamma with respect to the source ji of x. That is what we already had. Uh, phi i, sorry. Phi i of x. And uh, our original identity wa uh, was derived and is valid without the sources k. Therefore, at this point, we only know that this is valid at k equals 0, at k i equals 0, or it might even be valid for non-zero k under one condition, namely if it just happens that those additional terms, they are like additional terms in the Lagrangian, right? So if the whole Lagrangian, including the k terms, is still invariant under the same symmetry, then we can go through the same steps and then we would derive that this is valid even for arbitrary k. Or for all k, if this term k i times delta phi i is invariant under the same symmetry. Okay. So here we have now modified our slavnov taylor identity for gamma into a form which allows us uh, in a technically transparent and efficient way to deal with those new objects, namely the expectation values of um, composite operators. Let me just add a non-physics remark to this. 
Uh, so these identities go under different names in the literature. So we will call them Slavnov Taylor identity. And uh, other people call them differently. So in the Weinberg textbook, uh, they are called uh, equations. In uh, Denner's book, they are called Lee identities. Zinschester himself uh, uh, I don't know how he calls them, but uh, I think he calls them like BRS uh, calls them Slavnov Taylor identities. And also, we will call them Slavnov Taylor identities. But just so you know, once you read those books, uh, they are referring to the identical equations. And so, all of those equations uh, came up in the literature in the early 70s when people were discussing the renormalization of gauge theories. And there were lots of different proofs, first by Toft, then by Zinchester, and by Lee and uh, then by BRS, and they all used similar identities. And so each of them brought the identities into slightly different forms. Equivalent, of course, but slightly different looking. And in particular, that form uh, is particularly efficient. And uh, so therefore, it goes under different names. So indeed, uh, I already mentioned it just now. So the identities are general, depend just on symmetry transformations. But the most important application, historically in particular, was for the renormalizability of young mills theories, where we have local symmetry transformations and gauge invariances and BRS invariances. OK, in the afternoon, we uh, continue with a lecture, right? Um, and so in the morning, I will probably now start with a new topic. So this is the groundwork. And we have now formulated symmetries. And now let us do some application and look at symmetries and renormalization. Let us begin with this interesting point of the potential uh, for anomalies, symmetry breakings by quantum effects. And uh, in general, if you start with a classical theory, you have a classical symmetry, phi i goes to phi i plus delta phi i, and the classical Lagrangian, or the classical action, stays invariant, and you have a classical symmetry. Then at the quantum level, uh, in our formulation, it is totally obvious that there is no guarantee that the same symmetry is present as well. We have always stressed that we need to assume this and at the same time that the path integral measure is invariant. And so uh, obviously now uh, it can happen maybe that the path integral measure is not invariant. And then uh, maybe the classical symmetry has no quantum counterpart. So first of all, the question is in the quantum theory, the question is, is this gamma? also symmetric or not. And so indeed, maybe the path integral measure is not invariant.
And remember that the path integral measure is essentially equivalent to setting up a regularization and renormalization procedure. So you could as well say your regularization and renormalization procedure, how to deal with divergences, how to subtract them, is incompatible with a symmetry. Yep. Is there the setting a similar invariance relation what we encountered earlier? So like a modified invariance relation for the effective um, for the effective action that doesn't make or that also takes into account that the measure is not the same under so, I mean, in the end, these anomalies, there is still some control on what happens with the symmetry. So, there is some, uh, there will not be a zero on the right hand side of various identities, but what there is on the right hand side can be sometimes calculated and one can have control over it, and there are theorems related to it. And so, uh, maybe we can um, discuss this at uh, the appropriate points, yes. So, that is possible. So that means that the symmetry is maybe broken by quantum effects. Now going to our favorite case of dimensional regularization. There we know that the path integral measure is effectively defined by calculating Feynman diagrams in d dimensions and the measure defined in this way is always invariant under anything. Therefore, uh, the symmetry cannot be broken in this way, but it can be broken by the necessity to extend your Lagrangian to d dimensions. And then it might, of course, obviously happen that the d dimensional Lagrangian doesn't share the four dimensional symmetry. So again, the symmetry may be broken by quantum effects. Okay, and that is the definition of an anomaly in this context. It's defined as such a symmetry breaking by such quantum effects. There is an addition to the statement that we should require because as you know there is some freedom in the re regularization and renormalization procedure. For example in dimensional regularization you go to the dimensions and then you add counter terms in order to make the theory finite. In adding the counter terms there is some freedom. You can shift around finite parts, change finite parts, and so on, of course. Therefore, it might happen that by defining the finite parts of the counterterms in tricky ways, the symmetry actually is valid. And if you can find such finite parts of your counterterms uh, that make the symmetry valid, then you do not speak of an anomaly. You speak of an anomaly if there is absolutely no way at all that you can find counterterms which restore the symmetry. So, therefore, let me add, which cannot be compensated by adjusting finite counterterms. So, and the effect of this is that Ward or Slavnov Taylor identities are broken at order h bar. So, for example, in the case of a Ward identity, delta phi times d gamma by d phi is actually not zero, but let's call it its curly A, where curly A stands for the anomaly. And then maybe indeed 
you know what this is. It's uh, not random, but it's some specific quantity, and maybe you know what it is, how it behaves, and so on, and what is its impact on physics. Uh, similarly, and even easier to visualize, is if you go back to the Noether current. According to the classical symmetry, you have a Noether theorem because it's a continuous symmetry. And there is a Noether current, which in the classical theory is conserved. And so there is a quantum operator counterpart of that Noether current. And you would have a conservation relation d mu j mu equals zero. And now d mu j mu is not zero, but it is broken by, again, something, by order h bar. And again, you might know exactly what it is on the right-hand side. And in particular, there is a famous theorem, the so-called Adler-Bardin theorem, which uh, states exactly the right-hand sides of those equations for a very important case. Yes? Maybe this question is a bit silly, but hmm. um, all the time that you write, um, order h bar, does, it, does that mean that the breaking needs to happen at really order h bar? Or, or higher orders. Order Right. Yeah, it could happen at even higher orders, but it cannot happen at order h bar to the zero, which is the classical limit, because by uh, assumption we start from a classical symmetry. So it is not obvious at this point here, but uh, it can be established in, in um, other ways, and we will see how it can be established. Uh, that the existence of such an anomaly is a true physical effect. And it does not depend on the details of how you choose to regularize and renormalize your theory. Remember that we, in practice, always use dimensional regularization, but other people use different methods. But uh, as you see, the anomalies are manifesting themselves in this context in different ways uh, compared to how they manifest themselves in other contexts. But the existence and the physics impact of the anomaly is always the same, no matter how you derive it technically. Yes. And very good. So I think we still have a little bit of time. There are, in fact, exactly two very, very well-known and important examples for anomalies in quantum field theory and particle physics. And uh, I want to illustrate both examples briefly, maybe one in the morning and one in the afternoon. And the first example is scale invariance, the breaking of scale invariance in uh, quantum field theories. And actually, let me refer here to our quantum field theory 1A lecture from 2019. There we discussed that uh, very extensively in section uh, 632. So you can find many more details on what I will say now over there. So if you have an action and a classical Lagrangian which contains absolutely no dimension full quantities, only dimensionless quantities. That means there is no mass term in the theory where you have an explicit m square term which has some unit, but only, for example, terms like coupling g times phi to the 4 and g is a dimensionless number. Or a um, kinetic term d mu phi square with prefactor 1 half, which is a dimensionless number. If the Lagrangian is such that it does not contain any dimensionful quantities, then the theory corresponding to it is scale invariant. The physics is the same, no matter what uh, length scale you are looking at. Because the theory defines no uh, preferred length or energy scale. And technically, 
that corresponds to the following symmetry transformation. Namely, you can transform your space time variables, x, mu, uh, they are dimensionful, of course. So you scale them, let's say a parameter t to the minus one times your space time variable. So you really uh, scale up or down uh, your space time, but and you do the same with all other dimensionful quantities. First of all, derivatives scale in the opposite way, of course, because they are basically like 1 over x. And then a scalar field in the theory phi uh, has also dimension 1, just like a derivative. So you would also scale it in the same way. And if you do that, then your action is automatically completely invariant under this um, transformation. And so therefore, if you look at any green function um, on the classical level, it would have to respect this particular symmetry. Uh, so after, according to this, the action stays invariant. OK, and this, uh, it's useful to express this now as a differential equation. The differential equation hides a little bit the very simple uh, situation that we are having here, but let me nevertheless bring this into the form of, of a differential equation. Namely, it's the following. We have an integral over x of phi plus x mu d mu phi times derivative with respect to phi. So all of this here is a differential operator. And if you apply this differential operator on the classical action, you get 0. So this differential operator uh, means the following. It, on the one hand, implements here um, the fact that the field scales with a uh, coefficient uh, with the power 1. And the space time which is the argument of the field also scales with the inverse power. That corresponds to this field transformation. And then uh, the action is invariant under this. So this is a compact way, uh, but a bit cryptic way of formulating uh, the previous uh, nice invariants. So but this is a differential equation, which on the classical level holds, and which means scale invariance of the classical theory. And now, let us see whether this same equation is valid on the quantum level. And the answer is, it is not. Namely, uh, on the quantum level, and let us be specific for dimensional regularization plus MS bar renormalization, which is one possible choice of renormalization. There. There is an additional scale, namely the scale mu square, which appears in front of all the loop integrals. And uh, if you look at this uh, scale invariance, then let's say this effective um, term, which would appear in the definition of the regularized path integral, would be like this. So you have mu to the power of d minus 4 times the d-dimensional Lagrangian instead of the four-dimensional Lagrangian. So and this uh, mu appears in front here. And uh, that is how it appears in front of every loop integral. And so that is an additional scale. So if you would now uh, ask, is your quantum theory scale invariant, then you would say, uh, maybe yes. But at least I would have to introduce also the mu scale into this uh, scaling transformation. If you scale also mu in the same way as all the other dimensionful quantities, then uh, the theory would indeed be scale invariant. But mu is, of course, now a dimensionful quantity as part of the definition of the theory. And at the same time, it is unphysical. So you do not want that your physical um, predictions depend on mu, nevertheless, it uh, appears in the scale invariance relationship. And therefore, uh, it is a two-step procedure. We first derive an equation, uh, what is the role of mu? And then we can obtain a new scale invariance relation, which is independent of mu. And so the first step is the renormalization group equation, which we derived in that uh, lecture over there, which looks like this derivative 
mu times d by d mu plus a certain other differential operators, beta function times d by dg plus a few other terms acting on this uh, d-dimensional uh, action that is zero and so therefore this is also true if you apply it onto the quantum effective action gamma. So we have an equation for gamma which uh, relates the derivative with respect to mu with some other derivatives. And uh, from this we obtain a new scaling relation. So at first you would have a naive scaling equation which looks like this but there would be an additional derivative with respect to mu but the derivative with respect to mu we can eliminate by using the renormalization group equation and then we obtain a relationship that looks like this without derivative with respect to mu but there will be something else introduced namely for example the derivative with respect to g and so let me write down the full result just to see it we have here the same differential operator that came from here then we have minus beta times d by dg plus gamma times phi d by d phi and all of that acts on gamma and gives zero. And so here you see two additional terms appearing in this simple scale invariant case where we have one generic coupling and one uh, field in the theory. Namely, here let's look first at the second term. There is a new additional term with a field derivative and that additional term uh, has exactly the same form as the one which was there originally but originally uh, the field derivative had a coefficient 1 and that 1 here came from the dimensionality of the field operator phi. Now there is an additional object gamma times the same thing so effectively the 1 is replaced by 1 plus gamma so it, the field behaves as if its dimensionality would have been modified from 1 to 1 plus gamma so this is called anomalous dimension of the field. It appears exactly in the place where there would be dim the dimensionality of the field but it is not uh, the one that you have prescribed but it's an anomalous one. And here on top of this uh, even with the anomalous dimension, the theory is not scale invariant, but you also have a running coupling constant. And uh, so this is the modification uh, to scale invariants, and so this is one answer to your question from before. How do we know uh, how the anomaly behaves? Here we know. So this is the counterpart. So instead of being zero, uh, the scale invariance relation produces exactly two new terms and we have full control over those terms. We can calculate the beta and gamma functions by doing loop calculations. We might know what they are and so we know exactly how scale invariance is modified to broken scale invariance but the breaking is fully under control. But that is a very important and very interesting physics effect which basically happens in practically all quantum field theories because all quantum field theories with extremely few exceptions involve divergencies and whenever you have divergencies you have such a renormalization group equation uh, which produces here additional terms in the scale invariance relationship. Yep. I mean here uh, it is uh, 
kind of um, guaranteed to be physical because uh, even though uh, we are now in a specific renormalization scheme, the MS bar scheme, you can now calculate observables as a function of the MS bar scheme. But uh, and in this particular scheme, scale invariance is broken, which means, for example, that if you calculate a cross section for a process at 1 TeV, uh, and you scale it up to 10 TeV, the result will not correspond to the scaled uh, variation, but physics at 10 TeV behaves differently from physics at 1 TeV. That is the impact of this equation. And we are talking about physical observables here. So uh, and they are guaranteed to be independent of the scheme. In another scheme, uh, the equation might look differently, and you might parameterize observables in terms of other input parameters, and so the functional dependencies will look differently. But the relationships between different observables are always guaranteed to be independent of the scheme. And here, I mean, it's as simple as that, let's say, uh, cross-section at 10 TeV, uh, cross-section behaves like 1 over energy square. So at 10 TeV it would have to be 100 times smaller than at uh, 1 TeV according to scale invariance, but maybe it's only 90 times smaller. And then that is obviously a physical effect which corresponds to a breaking of scale invariance. And so I can only refer in the last moment to uh, this lecture here where we discuss it also apply to QCD, where QCD is really this nicest, most beautiful example of such a theory because pure QCD is scale invariant on the classical level. If you neglect the quark masses and everything, but then the output, the quantum QCD, contains protons, neutrons, pions, other mesons. So these are bound states at very specific masses. So the existence of a bound state with one GeV mass, but no bound state with half a GeV mass, obviously is the most uh, direct manifestation of a breaking of scale invariance. So QCD at one GeV behaves like you have a bunch of bound states with specific masses, but at 100 and 1000 GeV, it behaves like you see jets at the LHC uh, which behave almost as if the quarks were free. So QCD is totally non-scale invariant, and that is a physical effect which is described exactly by this equation. Okay, uh, so this is one example of anomalies, and in the afternoon I will tell you about the second example, and then we will go on. So see you then.